Stephen Beresford contacted us in February 2011. And uh, shortly after the, uh, the miners' strike and LGSM folding, I deposited the archive of the material in the People's History Museum in Manchester. And for a few years after that, I got approached by various writers, radio, TV, theatre, uh, with a view to kind of making something. And every single one of them came to nothing. So 20 odd years later, when Stephen approaches me, I was very lackadaisical, frankly, when, when I met him. Um, you know, just so, well, here we go again, this will amount to nothing. Although I must say, when he sat in my living room saying Universal Studios, as it was in, at that moment, I just thought, fuck me, <laughs> this is Hollywood. <laughs> Uh, and it's been incredible, and uh, Stephen has so much integrity, uh, he, he, he sought our trust in him, and he got that in bucket loads, really. And, Gethin, do you want to tell us, uh, I understand you've seen the film more than once. <laughs> yes, I've seen it 27 times now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when did you get involved? Um, I... I remember getting a Facebook message from uh, Mike saying, uh, this guy Stephen Beresford is coming to see me tomorrow. Um, vaguely heard of him, do you know anything about him? Um, and I replied, no, never heard of him and kind of never thought much more of it again. But then Stephen started uh, getting in touch with all of us and speaking to all of us. He spent about 18 months uh, speaking to people who were involved in LGSM originally, and people who were involved in the Neithda Licensed Wansley Valley Miners Support Group. Um, so I met with him actually at the Royal Festival Hall the first time, just to, to talk through my experience of the strike and of LGSM. And for the purpose of a drama, your mother is actually a fiction, and in, in fact, she's not quite the monster that she appears <laughs> on screen. <laughs> No, she's not. Um, my character is kind of very, very loosely based on me. Um, and the bit about my relationship with my mother and how beastly was. I mean, she is beastly, but... Um, no, she's it, not. In different ways. Um, <laughs> and uh, she's always been extremely supportive of myself and my two gay brothers. Um, she was absolutely thrilled with the film. She appears as an extra in the film. Um, and in homage to the film, she's actually recently made a life-size papier-mâché model of a miner wearing a Pits and Purvis t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Which, surprisingly, the um, National, Coal Mu uh, National Mining Museum uh, in Wales at, at um, Blaen Avon um, have accepted and put into their permanent <laughs> exhibition. <laughs> So, Ray and Reggie, um, you are, are both, you're a couple in real life and still are, and you were there, and can you tell us how your engagement with the film happened and what you've been doing? Yes, um, it's, it's, it's one of those stories that gets told around about how Stephen f first managed to get in touch with the, the group, um, and, and it was look, looking at All Out Dancing and Delights, which we made in... 1985, some of you may have seen it, if not, it's available on YouTube. You see us all slightly younger, well, actually 30 years younger, but anyway. Um, and uh, on the credits, my name was on the credits, and it's an unusual surname. And um, Stephen got in touch on Facebook, and that was the, the, the initial contact. And, and from that point on, we then, um, he, he met with the rest of the group. He came, like, like everybody else, Stephen came to see us um, on a number of occasions, came around to the, he only lives around the corner from us, so he came around to the house. and. Um, you know, started to, um, t to just to talk about, you know, our experiences. Um, I sent him away with all my photographs. Um, he still has them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> where is he? I must get those off him. Um, and, um, and, and, and then he came back again and again, and really it was just about how he was forming the story. And the fascinating thing for us was that um, we, you know, you tell the story and you tell the, the history of, of what happened and you say, well, it's very interesting and it's, you know, it's a really interesting time, but actually, how do you make it into a film? How do you turn, turn that story into something which people will want to sit for two hours like you just have and watch? And it was really, I think for us, the fascinating thing was watching Stephen develop the story. He always said he wasn't making a documentary, he was making a film. 
and so how he was developing the characters and, and as, as Gethin says, the changes he was making, you know, you know, the Reggie and Ray characters are, are very loosely based on us. We're not six foot and we weren't that butch at the time. But, um, <coughs> but you know, as they say, who would you like to be played for in a film? And that'll do me fine. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Second that, yeah. Um, so that was, that was really, you know, one of the most fascinating things for us. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was um, an interesting process um, because Stephen couldn't actually let us see the script or um, actually give us any details of what was happening in the film. So he had to try to talk to us and convince us that, that he was going to make the sort of film that we would be happy with. Um, and I think all of us can say that we're, we're very happy with the film. I mean, it's not a documentary, so there are, there's fictions in there, but in terms of representing the atmosphere of the time and the sense of solidarity and community, he's done a wonderful job. And Jeff, do you want to, to, to tell us about your, about your involvement with the film and maybe how you feel about being played by Freddie Fox? <laughs> um, well, he's incredibly cute, so I'm very, very uh, grateful to be shown in that, that way. Um, <laughs> I, I had a, an email from, from Stephen because I'd put um, uh, the All Out Dancing Delice video on, on the web and he'd found how to contact me through that. And, um, and I kind of didn't really think, well, I thought, oh, no, I don't really want to talk about this. I lived in Manchester, so I wasn't in touch with many of these people um, for a while. And um, I thought, oh, no, do I want to talk about that, and I don't really remember anything, that's the problem, I don't really remember anything that happened at the time, <laughs> I don't know. I remember, I was doing lots of videoing, and all of it sort of, all my memories seem to be of the video. Um, anyway, so, he, Stephen Lutt jokes that uh, he knows more about my story and my involvement with LGSM than, than I do. <laughs> anyway. And maybe, the others, if you pass the mic back to, to, to Mike, just to, to say, what, what do you think about your portrayal? Um, and did you work a lot with Joe? Um, that's a question quite naturally you get asked a lot. But actually, if you think about it, if you try and imagine how other people view you, you're either paranoid or mad. Uh, I think most, is most of the time, having a clue how other people perceive us. So the best measure is your friends or your family. And uh, they all just go, dead ringer. Um, he, he is slightly bonkers and so am I. He's from Chorley, which is 10 miles away from where, where I originate, so that's, you know, he's got the accent spot on. And when Stephen brought, brought him round to see me for the first time, can you just hold that a second, Donnie? Um, Joe remarked after three quarters of an hour, sitting fairly silently, kind of just observing me. He said, um, I'll tell you one thing you do a right lot, Mike. I said, what's that, Joe? And he said, you touch your face a lot like this. And one you do a right lot is this. Do you know what that is, Mike? That? That's desperation, that is. <laughs> and off he went into the night. <laughs> Very interesting. And um, Gethin, you're, so you're played by Andrew Scott. Um, and it, it's sort of you, but how, how do you feel about, about your portrayal? Well, I, I mean, unlike the characters for Mike and for Mark, and, and also for Havina and Sean. I don't think many of the others set out to be kind of recreations of the, the people whose names were perhaps attached to the characters. So there are elements of me. I worked in a bookshop, although I'm not engaged the word. Obviously, I'm Welsh, and there was that whole thing about going back to Wales and um, going back as a gay man to a Welsh-speaking working-class community and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but Andrew, I don't think set out to capture me, he set out to create a, a believable character who had a particular purpose in in the film. Um, and I think, you know, it's incredibly uh, flattering to even be vaguely associated with that. And Ray and Reg, you've, you've touched on, on your actors, but you did spend quite a lot of time with them. Um, we did, we have, yes, we met up with them, um, and but really their, their main concern, again, because as Gethin says, you know, they weren't, um, they weren't portraying us as such, but they were very keen to make sure that they were doing the group justice because you know these were these were um, composite characters and they were there to really bring you know the group was much bigger than the number of people you see in the film and the important thing was to represent the breadth of the group within the other characters in the film that was something that that, that um, Stephen was really keen to do so they were 
their big concern was that they were doing that justice. They were actually, you know, portraying the characters in a way which would which would be believable, and people would, you know, would, would the people from the group would be would would really feel they'd done them justice. So yeah. So but we were. It's great to have your names attached to them, and it's great that they're so good looking and all of that sort of stuff. You know, well, you're, you know. <laughs> you're all immortal now yes, on the silver right, screen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Jeff, or yeah. no, I have nothing to add to that. I don't think <laughs> that's right. Um, have you travelled with the film at all? I I haven't. No, you haven't. <laughs> but I've, you, I've been up in. Were you all on on set? I went to visit the uh, the set when they were doing the Pride Pride March preparation at um, in the park, and it was quite. It was really weird actually, because um, Stephen introduced me to all the actors and said, "This is the real Jeff. This is Reggie. This is Ray. This is Mike. This is Gethin." And it was like. I was going back into the past. It was really kind of bizarre because they had captured in the casting something of the characters that I remembered from the 80s. And although I hadn't seen many of them for many years, uh, I just was quite overwhelmed by that, actually. It was kind of really weird. Actually, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean we, we went on to the um, shooting of Pride March as extras, and if you look closely, you'll actually see us right at the very end um, and it was the most amazing experience because the amount of work they did in getting the detail right getting the badges right getting the clothes right um, and it was almost like being at the at the original pride itself and it was a very emotional experience um, obviously uh, as several people said it's not a documentary so the the storyline about the, um, the the formal vote not to continue with um, our support it, uh, never actually happened. Um, there was some resistance. Um, I think the NUM, as an organisation, was probably more resistant than the um, the local communities. Uh, we recently spoke to a filmmaker who um, had filmed lots and lots of stuff during the strike, but had been warned off filming us. Um, by the NUM, um, I guess because they thought it was a bit embarrassing. Um, but we ne we certainly never came across any kind of antagonism ourselves. Any, there was nothing directed at us. I mean, I guess the reason we persisted is because uh, we were, like, something which doesn't come out in the film, we were, of course, all trade unionists. We were all involved in various left organisations, whether it was the Communist Party or the Labour Party or the SWP or SLL or whoever. So we were all activists in one way or another, and I think before uh, we started LGSM, we'd all been at, um, raising money for the miners through other things, and we probably carried on doing that uh, as well. So it was a really important um, aspect of our lives to be involved in, in trade union stuff and solidarity stuff. And of course, it was just a massive um, movement across the country. We were a tiny part of um, something which brought whole communities out in support of the NUM. Um, there were you know, black communities in support of the miners, the Bangladeshi community, um, Sikh temples did collections. Uh, so we were a tiny part of, uh, of a mass movement. Actually, and there were regional groups all, all across the country. Yeah, there were, by the end of the strike, there I think there were 11 LGSM groups, so particularly active ones in Manchester and Edinburgh. Um, but th th there were 11 by the end of the strike, and obviously loads and loads of lesbian and gay activists would have been involved in supporting th uh, the miners through other groups. Yes, yes, we were back there, is it two weeks ago? We were down there, we had the 30th anniversary reunion in Oncloin, um, and uh, we all went down, we had I think 19 of us there from the group, um, and lots of people from South Wales too, so people who had been involved 30 years ago um, all came together um, um, in the welfare hall that you see in the film, that one, and it's, it looks exactly the same. They've changed the curtains, but, <laughs> but that's about it. Honestly, it was, it was the most incredible thing to go back into that hall, and it was just exactly the same. So we, yeah, we had a great time down there just recently. And of course, we've, we've been making, throughout the, uh, the process, keeping in contact with people too. And it's been, that's been really one of the best things actually about reconnecting with not only people in the group, but also people in, in Wales as well. 
Yeah, I, I just want to say that haven't only changed the curtains, other things have changed too. Um, we met a, um, two young lesbians born just after the strike uh, in Seven Sisters uh, in the Swansea Valley. Um, and they'd recently got married on the rugby field of Seven, Seven Sisters Rugby Football Club. And they'd had 350 people from the village at their wedding, all in the stand of the rugby club. Um, that's something that wouldn't have happened 30 years ago. That's something that certainly changed. And it was just amazing. I think uh, that kind of reaction is uh, over-egged in the media. It's the job of the ultra-right, it's the job of the ultra-rich to keep that propaganda going incessantly because if they don't, if they ever drop that, they've had it because we are the many. <laughs> Steph was absolutely real um, and she still did... Still is. She still is, yeah. Uh, she's living in North Devon. She's living quite a quiet life. Uh, she gave Stephen carte blanche permission to kind of do as he would with her character. Obviously, once he'd drawn up her character, he, he consulted her about it. And she said something like, darling, just do what you want. Yeah. Um, and we were very fortunate to get her down to the premiere and she really enjoyed it. So she's kind of connected to us again, but in North Devon. Yeah. So, so Ray and I have kept in touch with Stephanie um, all through the, the years and, and, and followed her. She sort of managed to move further and further away from us, but uh, so, you know, now she's in North Devon. But uh, yeah, but she's, she's, she's happily living there with her chickens and her dogs and her cats and, uh, and is thrilled, absolutely thrilled with the, the way the film has come out. I, I think all of us think that was the one off-key moment. Um, obviously, it, it gave Stephen the opportunity to kind of raise a laugh with, uh, I don't care if you're, Arthur, if you're Arthur Scargill, don't talk during the bingo. Um, but it misrepresents uh, the relationship we had with Lesbians Against Pit Closures and the relationship with the, the lesbians involved in Lesbians Against Sport, the Miners. Um, I think we were all 100% um, supportive of uh, the idea and understood the need for a women's organisation. A lot of what was happening, a lot of the money that was being raised was in, in women-only uh, spaces, women-only venues. Um, so yeah, I think, that, I think it's a shame. I think it's, it's the one area where we, we feel, you know, kind of, we'd rather that hadn't been written as it was. Um, uh, I mean, to, to my mind, and I'm sure most of us felt like this, if we were all going, organizing autonomously as lesbians and gay men, then, you know, it, it makes sense that lesbians themselves will organize uh, separately. Uh, but there were some lesbians who were actually in both organisations, so it was much more fluid than, than you might imagine from the movie. Yeah. Um, yes, certainly in the Neath Dallas and Swansea Valley, they organised meetings around the issue of Section 28. They campaigned against Section 28. Um, they obviously maintained links with us during the kind of pretty grim decade that followed on when so many people... Um, died and a lot of us uh, spent most of our time kind of nursing people who were ill or, or mourning people who had died. Um, so the support and uh, comfort we got from our friends in, in those communities was really important. Um, but I think even wider than that, obviously the, the film mentions the role of the NUM in the 1985 um, Labour Party conference in, in not only voting for but kind of mobilising support in a really kind of gargantuan scale for, for the, um, the gay rights amendment. Um, but the NUM kind of, th throughout the NUM, there were kind of incidents of local groups taking on um, gay issues. Uh, we recently learnt about a, uh, a lodge who um, campaigned to get the National Coal Board to give equal access to coal board housing for same-sex couples. Uh, we heard about a gay pub in Nottingham um, who were being hassled by the police and suddenly turned up, the police turned up one night to find it packed full of miners who'd come there to show their support. Um, and we were up in Kellingley, um, which you may have heard recently. Uh, Kellingley's one of the last three deep mine pits in, in the UK. Um, it's 
under threat of very imminent closure, the government have just refused um, to uh, provide some funding that would have kept it open and maintained the jobs there. Uh, but when we were up there a few weeks ago helping the campaign there, uh, we learnt that about 18 months ago, when they were still recruiting miners, they'd recruited in South Wales and a group of 20 South Wales miners had moved up to Kellingley, which is on the edge of Pontefract. Um, and when they uh, arrived, they were looking for accommodation and the 20 of them ended up living for four months in rooms above the gay pub in Pontefract and had an absolutely fantastic time. And I think the Pontefract gay community had a fantastic time as well. Uh, so that's kind of part of the legacy of us, I think. Because when they were teased about it, why are you living in a, in a, in a gay pub? They simply told the story of lesbians against support the minors.